welcome to Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. Here we explore the training and development of America's leaders in the application of air power and the profession of arms. The views expressed are those of the hosts and do not reflect the official policy or position of the United States Air Force, Department of Defense, or the U.S. government. The mention of companies by name is solely for the purpose of discussion and should not be implied as endorsement. Welcome back to another episode of Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. I'm Colin Slade. And I'm Reed Gann, and we're your hosts for Commission Ed. Colin, today we are going to bring the first in of two interviews where we interview Lieutenant Colonel Matthew Shakespeare Hoyt. He is a flight medicine doctor, and he is going to give us two insights that I think are really interesting. First, how to get in through the Healthcare Professional Scholarship Program. As you'll see as we go through this interview, this is an incredible deal. Yeah. For the people that can get in and get selected for this program, it's pretty remarkable. Don't want to give away all the details there. And then in the second episode, he's going to talk about being in flight medicine, being a flight doctor and a flight surgeon, what that means. It's a really interesting career field. And again, don't want to give away all the details, but I'm looking forward to bringing you these two interviews with Lieutenant Colonel Hoyt. Yeah, really enjoyed listening to these two interviews that you did with Matt. There's a great wealth of experience. But one thing that is really important for us to highlight before we do anything else for these episodes is that while Matt is a medical professional, he is a doctor, he is fully aware of all of the medical standards, he is not your doctor. And so you should not be reaching out to him asking for medical advice your particular situation, you know, pursuing a waiver or anything like that, those things are better routed through your specific doctor, through your treatment facility, not through email to us. Exactly. He is very willing to answer questions about the healthcare professions, about being a flight surgeon, about HPSP, about maybe even process things. But if you send us a medical question, I'm just not going to forward it on to him. I'm just not going to do it. Yeah. We got to steer away from that. A quick little caveat. I know Matt really well. I'm literally going to hang, you know, do a double date with he and his wife tonight. Like we're close. And I totally got lost. When I did this interview with Matt, <laughs> it was in person in my basement. And I kind of forgot to do the usual, hi, who are you? How did you join the Air Force in the first episode? Yeah. Because I just know these things. And so that's going to be in the second episode. So if you want to know the details about him and how he came into the Air Force, he's actually got a pretty interesting journey. That's going to be in the second episode where we talk about being a flight surgeon. So my bad, I'll own that. I forget sometimes how I'm close to Matt. And as a result, I was just going off of, like you said, Colin, before we were recording, I just wanted to know about HPSP because it's yeah. such a weird thing that I never really understood that I was just like, talk to me about HPSP. And we just like dove right in. So right. apologies <laughs> to you. I'm sorry I got lost, but um, yeah, pretty close with Matt. And so that's why the order went in the direction it did. Yeah. So like you said, Reed, there's going to be these two interviews two episodes, and then in two more weeks, we'll hear from him again. But this first one is specifically about the HPSP program. Yes. So with that, we're going to turn it over to Lieutenant Colonel Matt Shakespeare Hoyt and my interview I had with him a few weeks back. Today, I have a really special guest. Uh, this is my friend, Lieutenant Colonel Matt Shakespeare Hoyt. Welcome to the show, Matt. Hey, thank you. Yeah, really glad you could join us, sir. I said I would get that sir in there, so yeah. I'm definitely getting <laughs> it in. So Matt, you and I met in Montgomery. Yes. So I was stationed there as an OTS instructor, as our audience is well aware, and you were there as a medical professional. That's correct. Yeah. How long were you at, at Maxwell? I was there for two and a half years. Okay. Okay. So, and after that, you left for sunny Hawaii. Yeah. Hardship duty yeah. tour. Someone's got to do it. Yep. Awesome. So our audience may remember, but about two years ago, I did an episode where we talked about the variety of different ways that someone can take a different path to get to OTS. Yeah. And there's well over a hundred different paths. <laughs> there's so many different ways of being a reserve or a guard or active duty. And then the different, you know, line versus non-line rated versus not, it just mm -hmm. goes on and on. Well, today you are going to introduce us to one of the primary ways that healthcare professionals make it through OTS and into the Air Force, 
and that's the Healthcare Professional Scholarship Program, or HPSP. This is a program that we've gotten a lot of questions about, and I just don't know. And so I've never been able to answer <laughs> those questions. And so today, Lieutenant Colonel Hoyt's going to come on, and he's going to help us understand how this works. So let's just very briefly, what's the like big scope of how healthcare professionals can make it into the Air Force? Sure. So your main pathways include direct accessions through people who are already practicing physicians. They can can have either a loan repayment type incentive or just a signing bonus or whatever, and they can directly come into the Air Force. You have your HPSP, which is what we're talking about, where either before they start medical school or during medical school, they get on this scholarship program, which helps pay for at least a portion of medical school. And then they have a commitment afterwards to serve time in the military. You have your ROTC, which typically after you get commissioned through the line after ROTC, you go into medical school. While you're in medical school, you're in reserve status, and then you recommission as a medical corps officer at the end of medical school and then go in as a medical corps officer. And then your service academies. That's the other. And the service academy route is very similar to your ROTC route where uh, you graduate from your service academy with your line commissioning, and then you move on to whatever your secondary piece of education is. Okay. So when we're looking at those, you know, those big buckets of pathways, does mm -hmm. HPSB cover like a bulk of them or is it a smaller portion? I get the sense it seems like it's kind of a lot. Yeah. Like, I don't know the exact breakdown in numbers, but most of the people that I've interacted with came through the HPSB program. I've had a few people that were direct to sessions and then an even smaller number that came through service academies. Okay. So that's one of the reasons I think we get this question a lot is this seems like the common pathway for a lot of healthcare professionals. Yeah. One thing that I didn't mention, HPSB is not just Air Force, correct? No, I mean, it's all services, Army, Navy, Air Force. In fact, the university, the healthcare university where most active duty ROTC graduates and service cadets go, it's tri-service. And a lot of times they go there thinking, I'm going to go in to this service. And sometimes they switch during school. It's kind of funny. But yeah, HPSP, it's all three services. They usually have somebody from each of those services that's on campus. They all hang out together and they all try to recruit you to their specific service. But um, they we work know, very we well together. We know you chose wisely, Matt. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. I knew enough about the Army and the Navy and how they did their postgraduate pathways of furthering their career to know that the Air Force was the only way to go. Yeah. And we're actually going to use that as a quick little uh, preview of a future episode that we're going to do where you're going to come back on and talk about your time as a flight surgeon. There's a lot of really interesting things that go into that specific career field and the intricacies and the association with aircraft, airmen yeah. and flyers. And so I'm looking forward to bringing you that. So we'll save some of our real good stories for that sure. in the future. Yeah. But now let's put ourselves in you know, the head of you know, maybe a soon-to-be high school graduate thinking about school. They're kind of looking at their different ways. When and how should someone kind of chart their path if they feel like the medical professions are something for them, but obviously medical school is incredibly expensive. They feel that call to service. What's the timing look like? So really, the earlier you make the decision, the better off you are because you can start that conversation and start getting the information. And the nice thing is, is you get a chance to do a little shadowing with somebody who's already a physician in the military and get to see from their perspective what it's like to actually do what you're thinking about doing. The sooner you start that, the better. Typically, if you're going to look at HPSB, the latest you'd want to start is probably about the same time you're putting in med school applications. Start that conversation. So in your undergrad year, the year before you're going to graduate, while you're doing that whole process, that would be probably the ideal time. If no kidding, that's the route you want to go. If you're not quite sure, the nice thing is about HPSB is you can be a second or third year med student and still apply for HPSB and get some of your school paid for and still get the benefits of being on a scholarship, covering some of that expense and then joining right into the service right out of med school. Okay. So there is a wide range of options, Yeah, but obviously... If you don't have to pay for three years of med school, if the Air Force is going to pick up that tab, yeah. it might have been a good idea to talk. Sooner rather than later, yeah. Yeah, and do you have to go to a recruiter for this? This isn't like just an online application, right? I'm guessing you're going to have to talk to somebody. I mean, ultimately, you're going to have to go through someone. There's definitely information out there that you can get online first and parts of the application that are filled out online. Just navigating, you know, your MEPS physical and all your other stuff. It's just, it's easier if you have the assistance of a recruiter and, you know, 
luckily when you're going to the medical corps, the recruiters are not trying to paint a picture that is unrealistic of here's all the promises we're going to make. You're already in a career path. So you're already in a direction that you're going in to be a doctor. What kind of doctor are you going to be? That's kind of where it comes down to. And the reality is, is, you know, there's a ton of primary care doctors in the military. There's a ton of surgeons in the military because those are assets that are deployable. Those are assets that are useful for the line mission. There's not that many pediatricians and there's getting to be less and less because what does a pediatrician do for you when you're deployed? Not a whole lot because they don't deploy your children. Thankfully, Same thing for, aren't we so glad? <laughs> exactly. And there's other specialties that they just have so few because the need for them is so small. Like some of your really specialist oncologists, which take care of cancer. Luckily, our population is pretty young and healthy, so we don't have a lot of an incidence of that, that you need a whole bunch of those. So you see your basic primary care and surgical specialties are the big ones, and then less and less of those things that are more niche kind of specialties. Yeah, that's a really good perspective. I mean, I think even those of us who wear the uniform kind of forget sometimes that the mission, Mm -hmm. the real mission, the reason we exist, the reason we're in garrison at home is to prepare to go to war. Yep. And so some of those niceties, I saw, for example, that, you know, like veterinary medicine, you can get your degree through HPSB and sponsor it and become a veterinarian. But I'm guessing that the primary responsibility of the veterinarians is to care for like service animals Mm -hmm. instead of, it's nice that you can take your cat to the base vet, but that's not the primary mission that they exist for. Yeah. So that helps to cage the mindset of the people who might be thinking about this program. Like, remember why we're here. If you want to be, you know, this incredible specialist, that's great. And maybe we might have some of those positions, but we might not also. And it's also, if you're one of those specialists, there's very few places where they have facilities that you can function in. So you're limited on where you're going to go. A primary care doc can go pretty much anywhere. Anywhere that the Air Force has a base, primary care is there. But, you know, some of your surgical specialties and some of your other, you know, unique specialties, you're only going to be in one of their larger med centers, San Antonio, here at Wright-Patterson, Andrews Air Force Base in D.C., Travis in California, big med centers, Nellis in Las Vegas is another one. You see those robust facilities, the Air Force just doesn't have many of them. The Army has more of them. But even the Army has limits on what they maintain, even in their bigger med centers. So there's not many options. Okay. Yeah, that's really good to help. Again, you know, I'm trying to get in the head of that. You know, maybe they're halfway through college and they're thinking about med school, but they're not really sure. They still have that call to serve. That's really, yeah. that's a really helpful perspective. All right. So let me give you my background with med students. Aside from always having a doctor that I would go to on base, right? That's pretty much most service members interaction. When I was an instructor at OTS, there was always a summer surge. There was an influx of hundreds of HPSB, almost exclusively, students that would come in and go through during the summer. That's when all of the OTS reservists, the instructors who were in the reserve, they would come and do their entire, all of their days, all of their service time would be during the summer to supplement all of these incoming students. Yeah. It was unreal. And I later learned that's because they're attending medical school and they don't have a whole lot of freedom. And so during one of their summers, yep. they would go to OTS and, and not get commissioned. So let's talk through that. That's what I want. That's this sure. was a long intro into help me out with the order of operations here. Absolutely. Because this is different than I graduate, I commission, or I go to OTS, I commission, and I'm in. It's a different order. So walk us through how that works. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. So as soon as I accepted the scholarship from the Air Force, I interviewed, I did all my paperwork, got my physical redone because I had already had one for ROTC, but got a new physical, got accepted, received an actual like, you've been accepted into the HPSB. That gave me the ability to commission. So I commissioned as a second lieutenant in a reserve status while I was a med student. And I stayed in that second lieutenant reserve status throughout the entirety of my med school Okay, so I'm just imagining Matt Hoyt standing in somebody's office. I actually was in my grandfather's home because he's a retired army lieutenant colonel. Okay. So someone actually did like swear mm-hmm. you in. Okay. Cause yep. I, but you basically signed some paperwork yep. and put that date on there. The date that I actually took the oath and signed it. My grandfather signed it as the one administering the oath. And I gave that back to my recruiter and they like, okay, that's un- now a permanent part of your file. Here's your date of when you commissioned into the air force. So did they give you a CAC? Um, I didn't get a CAC right then. 
but I was able to take paperwork. I was in med school in Southern California, went to the closest base, was able to go and get a cat card. And I believe it was a reserve cat card because that was the status I was in. Because I had that cat card the first time I rotated on an active duty base as a third and then a fourth year med student. But, so, but essentially you were in the Air Force as yes. of that moment. Yeah. That is my official date of a session was like January 8th, 2003. Wow. That's when I took my oath of commissioning. And then because I had already started med school, I went to OTS between my first and second year of med school. The ideal timing of what they would like to have is you go to OTS the summer before you start med school. Okay. Because you're graduating from undergrad in May, June ish. So go to OTS, start med school in August ish. And then the summer between your first and second year is really your last summer as a med student. So that year, what they're trying to do is actually send all of the transition first to second year med students, their HPSP scholarship recipients to the aerospace medicine primary course, teach them how to do profiles, teach them how to do all the administrative mission critical medical items. Yeah. And then your third and fourth year, your reserve time that you're paying back, you just do one of your four week med school rotations at a military hospital. To kind of like spin you up so yeah. that when you get to your next, your first installation, mm -hmm. it's not You've quite as familiar. Okay. Absolutely. And that's really the order of how they do it. That's the ideal order. That's for a four-year HPSP student that got their scholarship set up before they started med school, which is why I say the ideal is, you know, as soon as you're starting to apply to med schools, you should be talking to a recruiter to get the HPSP stuff set up. Real quick on that is... HPSB, I mean, it's got to be contingent upon your acceptance into med school, mm -hmm. right? You yes. can't be, you can't have one without the other, clearly. That's correct. Okay. Yeah. And that's why that conversation's good because basically they can have everything teed up. So once you get accepted, then it's like, here's your paperwork, go ahead and, you know, we'll get you set up. And, and that way they can set up a more intentional time of when to do your commissioning and everything officially. Well, and then all the money side of it, too, because yeah. that's something we haven't really talked about. But this is a scholarship. Yes. They are paying Tuition for books medical and fees. school. That is a huge, huge <laughs> deal. Yeah. Especially in this day and age with the exorbitant costs of higher education. Yeah. I mean, that must have been a pretty good day. Oh, yeah. I mean, like, so I was married, already had my first child, pregnant with my second. I wasn't pregnant. My wife was pregnant with my second. Yeah. So facing $350,000 of debt. That's what my classmates all pretty much knew that was going to be the average debt that we would have been taking to pay for it by ourselves. And so anyway, having the opportunity for the Air Force to take three years of that and trim it down to, you know, a significantly smaller debt was huge. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. As a result, I mean, you've already mentioned that it's competitive. I'm guessing it's really competitive when you think about just that outlier of funds at the beginning. Yeah. There's a reason that the intention is to get people that can truly do the job in the Air Force because you're committing several hundred thousand dollars up front to train that individual. Similar to the, like, you'd think there'd be more of a commitment requirement. You think about the cost of training a pilot, it's pretty expensive, but the commitment is several years. Med school, even though it's so expensive, the commitment is still pretty small. I mean, the year for year commitment in general with a minimum of two years, that's a small commitment for having several hundred thousand dollars of expense just to cover your tuition books and fees. Yeah, I mean, that one-to-one -one is a pretty common outlier for any training that mm -hmm. you do. Yeah. If you don't know what the payback is gonna be, a one-to-one -one is a pretty fair starting point. Yeah. I just did a special program in the National Capital Region. It was a three-year program. I have a three-year payback. Yep. It's pretty common. Okay, that was the last piece is that commitment, you know, and I know we talked about that. Also, there's some differences with rank and things. So it was always weird for me as a student when I was at OTS, there were all these like captains and majors walking around who were yeah. getting yelled at just like I was. And yeah. that was very confusing, <laughs> right? So when you commissioned right during med school, yes, you commissioned as a second lieutenant. That's correct. And then you held that until you graduated. Yes. And then you became a captain. Yep. Just bam. The day I graduated, retook the oath of commissioning as a captain, and that's my official date of rank for the rest of my active duty time. Okay. Because that day I graduated. So I always remember I graduated on the 17th of May because that's my date of rank. That's when I actually took my oath of commissioning and recommissioned as a captain. Okay. But you commissioned as a captain with zero years. 
So during OTS, I did OTS as a second lieutenant. A lot of those captains and majors, they're people that came into the Air Force as direct accessions, or they had just finished med school and they were doing a loan repayment scholarship instead of a, we're going to pay for your school while you're going to school. They're going to pay back some of your school loan in exchange for those years of commitment. So those guys, they've been a captain or depending on if they're coming in because they've been working in the civilian sector for several years, they may come in as a lieutenant colonel. Yeah. So you may have, and that's kind of odd when you get that lieutenant colonel that knows nothing but yet they're wearing lieutenant colonel rank and everybody just assumes, oh, you're a lieutenant colonel, you know what's going on. Yeah. It's very funny. We had a mixture. My OTS class, there was a bunch of second lieutenants, handful of captains, a few majors, and then one lieutenant colonel. And he was the, whatever, the flight leader, the, the flight leader, yeah. you know, and he couldn't remember, you know, about face, was it to the left or to the right? I don't know which way I'm going. <laughs> so marching and facing movements, that was the best. Like nobody had a clue what they were doing. And you get four weeks to learn everything about being an Air Force officer. And that's it. And then you go back to school. Yeah. So. Yeah. It was a little bit maddening. I've got to tell you, when I was going through, it was a 13 week program. Yeah. And you'd see three classes of, at the time, COT, Commissioned yep. Officer Training, yep. come and go during your time. And you're like, I'm never leaving here. This is like the worst prison ever. Right. But, that's actually changing. And I don't know how much you know about this and we'll talk about it offline, but sure. now they're all one program. Yeah, uh, There are some rules. There's still a five and a half week program for a lot of the HPSB because they actually have a law. They can only do 45 training days a year. That's because of your interesting reserve status. Yep. And so they don't want to take up every single minute of your 45 days at OTS. So it gives them some flexibility. I know they're working on that, but right now everyone goes through the same program. They all go through together and I think that's for the good. But Matt, thanks so much for joining and teaching us about HPSB. Now, again, audience, I want to let you know, Matt's going to come back on here in a future episode. Where we're going to talk all about being a flight surgeon. And it's a very interesting career field because it's really specialized to what we do and being an airman. And I think that'll be really interesting. So we're going to save the best stories for that one. Anything you want to leave us with before we wrap up today, Matt? No, just thanks very much for having me. It's uh, been a pleasure and uh, hopefully it's useful. Yeah, awesome. So Matt, if anybody wants to reach out to you and maybe ask questions about HPSP or what it means to be a flight surgeon, how can they get in touch with you? So for anybody that's looking to come into the Air Force, probably best if they connect through you. If anybody's in the military already and is just like, hey, I'm looking of transitioning to something, I'm on global. So hit up the global email and I'm happy to talk with anybody. Perfect. Yeah. So with that audience, if there's anything you want to reach out and talk to Lieutenant Colonel Hoyt, you can find us on social media or at Air Force Officer Podcast at gmail.com. Awesome. Thanks for joining us, Matt. Really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you. Reed, thank you so much for bringing Matt onto the show. Matt, thank you for providing your expertise. Really looking forward to hearing from you again in a couple of weeks. Such great information here. And I hope that people recognize really, truly how important and awesome this scholarship program is. There are a couple of things that I feel like we do need to clarify, though. So first of all, Matt mentions that the scholarship pays for tuition, books and fees. But he didn't mention exactly the amount that is paid for this. Like, is it a you know $50,000 cap per year kind of scholarship? And so I think it's important that we share with the audience exactly what the terms and conditions are for HPSB. So, Reed, if you would talk to us a little bit about what is included. Is there a cap? What is the actual compensation that is provided to the recipient of this scholarship? Yeah. So this is coming directly from airforce.com on HPSP scholarships. Quote, these scholarships cover all tuition and required fees, including textbooks, small equipment items, and supplies needed for study. You will also receive a monthly allowance for living expenses. While on scholarship, you will spend 45 days on active duty in the Air Force. And once you graduate, you will serve one year of active duty for each year of scholarship serving a minimum of three years. Whoa. <laughs> so now I will caveat all of this. There are probably some specifics and details that you may want to follow up with, you know, the people that you're working with is in recruiting. However, comma, it says right here on the website, all tuition and required fees, including textbooks, small equipment, and supplies needed for study. That's a lot of money. It is. I mean, people go to medical school and will go into, you know, $300,000, $400,000 in debt 
to become a medical professional and spend the next, you know, 10, 20 years of their life paying that all back. But here through HPSP, you can become a medical professional debt free and you only have to serve three years. What? Yeah. It's a one for one commitment. And that's something that really stood out to me. I thought the commitment would be bigger, right? I explained this in the interview with Matt. It's a pretty common thing. Whenever you get a good deal from the Air Force, you get selected for a training program, you get tuition, you you know, whatever it is, there's generally a payback of one to one. Yeah. Translation. If you get one year of awesomeness from the Air Force, they're going to expect one year of payback. I explained how I did an internship. I did a three-year program. And it was amazing. I got to choose what job I wanted to do. I got to move through a major organization and pick what I wanted to do. It was incredible. I have a three-year payback as a result of that three-year assignment. That's pretty normal. However, comma, for the things that are hard to recruit, for the things that are extra expensive, i.e. pilot training, you usually have a much bigger commitment. And so it just yeah. really surprised me that with our medical professionals, highly skilled, very employable, very mm -hmm. marketable people. It's a one-to-one. -one. I found that very interesting. Yeah. And if you just look at like the total dollar amount value, a similar expense that is paid for by the Air Force would be such as the Air Force Academy, where it's often thought of as being like a $400,000 value across those four years. But then there's a five-year payback. Yeah. So we're actually looking at a similar dollar amount, but fewer years given back to the Air Force. It just is such an incredible deal. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, just <laughs> overwhelming almost. And because it is such an incredible deal, lots of people want to do it. So this is a highly competitive program. It's very selective. The Air Force can pick and choose exactly who they want to fill these spots, right? Yeah, that led me to exactly what you're talking about here. The Air Force, in this regard, does not appear to have a recruiting problem. Mm -hmm. They do not have a short of candidates who are interested because the return on investment for the individual is massive. Yep. When I was at OTS as an instructor 2016-2017, the Surgeon General of the Air Force actually came to officer training school in an attempt to address what they felt were shortcomings in their officer corps, in the medical side of things. Because the attitude had been in the medical community, people are going to come, they're going to get in, they're going to get out, and I'm just going to continue to create new ones because I don't have a recruiting problem. They did have a retention problem, and they did have a leadership problem. They weren't able to keep and retain good talent right. and generate good senior leaders. That was the attitude of the Surgeon General of the Air Force at the time. And as a result, they changed officer training school for all the people that were coming in. And instead of just going to the, what, four or five weeks and then leave through COT, commissioned officer training, they wanted to go through, quote, normal officer training school. So the full eight weeks yeah. and, and an attempt to try and address some of those gaps. And I just think about a career field or an attitude or a culture that would result from, oh, I don't have any problem getting people in so I can maybe mistreat them, <laughs> use them up, yeah. because I'm just going to have an <laughs> infinite supply. So I can see how that's something that you would want to address as a senior leader. Yeah. And actually, Reed, I think that that there is really just a microcosm of kind of Air Force culture in general, in that the Air Force usually does not have a recruiting problem. Yes, there are specific jobs, your career fields, both officer and enlisted, that are constantly critically manned, right? You can't get enough people into those different positions in order to really meet mission requirements. There are those career fields. But broadly speaking, big picture, holistically across all the numbers, the Air Force does not struggle to meet its quota to fill the number of authorized bodies by Congress, right? Yes. When you get into the finer details of specific life experience, specific backgrounds, specific skill sets, capabilities, knowledge, those get to be slightly harder. But overall, when we look at just gross numbers, yeah, I agree with that. It makes me think of this quote that I happened upon while I was reading Building the Elite. 
And this book is focused on what it takes to create a special operations soldier or a special operator, right? But when I read this, I was like, whoa, this is the Air Force, if not anything else. It says, eventually the system produces a lot of injured people, but the nature of the feedback loop makes it difficult to connect the processes that produce the injuries, and the system remains largely unchanged. All of the injured people are forgotten, the survivors are highlighted, and new people are fed into the funnel. Is that not exactly what we're describing here? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> There's this infinite supply of bodies. Take the medical profession specifically. Because this program is so beneficial to the member, there's that huge return on investment, like you said. They didn't have a recruiting problem. They could just constantly feed people into the funnel, but they get bruised, battered, and broken. And so they punch out where those who survive in that type of system are able to continue on. And they're like, hey, it worked for me. And so that feedback loop doesn't get closed or fully identified or understood. Obviously, the Surgeon General saw that there was something wrong. And he was trying to get after it. But it's very difficult to nail down exactly what is the issue and then try to fix it after the fact. Yeah. And I think this is only going to become more and more apparent as the change in the retirement system comes more fully into realization. Yeah. Because the people are going to be less incentivized to stay longer. They're going to be more mobile. They're going to be able to take their TSP with them whenever they transition out instead of the all or nothing from the high three retirement system that had been in place for so long. And so I think the Surgeon General was definitely strategic and thinking ahead and, and visionary in that. And I think I see that in our leaders now. They're talking about this kind of thing. I'm not sure we're moving fast enough. I'm very intrigued to see other changes, but I do wonder if that is a part of what's going on writ large in the Air Force as we try to address some of these challenges, because keeping the right people is going to be increasingly hard as we move forward. Yeah. We're talking about this in an Air Force context. The Air Force does not have a recruiting problem for medical professionals. But there's also something here that I think that we need to explain that the Air Force is not the only service that participates in the HPSP. Matt talked about in the interview how that there are three services that do it, Army, Navy, and the Air Force, right? But I think it's important here to explain why is it those three services? Why not the Marine Corps? Why not the Space Force or Coast Guard, like what's going on there, right? So the reason that is, is that the Marine Corps and the Space Force do not have their own medical personnel attached. The Marines rely on the Navy and the Space Force is going to rely on the Air Force to provide their medical services. And the Coast Guard is part of the Homeland Defense. So they're kind of in their own weird category when it comes to that kind of thing. Yeah. And in the event that the Coast Guard is activated for wartime environment, they too, like the Marine Corps, fall under the Navy. And so they receive medical treatment and attention from the Navy. Yes. You know, Colin, that's a good transition to kind of the one of the last things we want to talk about is why medical exists and how in a deployed environment, it's not necessarily the case that you're going to be seen by only your service. Now, depending on where you are and what you're doing, that may be the case. But a human being is a human being. A body is a body. And while there are some specific things that are unique to the services and what they do, and we'll talk about that next week a little bit more when we go into flight medicine, overwhelmingly, a medical professional can treat a service member irrespective of who they are and what they're doing. Yeah. And actually, Reed, that's one of the reasons why I've thought in the past that maybe we don't really need Air Force officers to be doctors. Maybe we can outsource that to the civilian sector. But especially as we listen to Matt in the next episode, we'll hear more about the operational medical mission and why it's important that the Air Force preserves that capability, that we have deployable operational medical professionals that can help in situations that can do their job in the wartime environment, which Yes, even when deployed, they're still going to be dealing with sprained ankles and colds and doing vaccinations and stuff like that, just like they would in garrison. But there is an operational aspect 
to the military medical profession that cannot be provided by civilians. And so while I may not fully understand all of those different aspects, I'm coming back around to the idea that this is a capability that needs to be preserved and trained for and prepared so that the Air Force is able to do its mission. Absolutely. And I think that is a great place to leave it, Colin, because we're really setting ourselves up for a really excellent next episode where we talk about flight medicine and the unique things that honestly only Air Force officers should be deciding. And I yeah. really look forward to bringing that to our audience. Again, huge thank you to Lieutenant Colonel Matthew Shakespeare Hoyt. Really appreciate you joining us. We look forward to sharing next episode when we talk about flight medicine. With that, is there anything before we wrap up today, Colin? No, thanks for tuning in today. That will do it for this week's episode of Commissioner. Ed.